I think we need to be building a movement, a worldwide movement for justice, for sanity, for ecological balance, for the understanding that the world is relational. And I think we need to make that movement one that is a welcoming movement. Now, by welcoming, I mean, first of all, it actually has to be a movement that encompasses a broad diversity of people. Not just people who look like us and think like us and come from the same background, but understanding that a movement for justice has to be a movement of the people who are currently uh, at the wrong end of the stick as far as injustice goes. And that we often need to take guidance and learn from what those people are telling us. Uh, I was fortunate enough over Thanksgiving to go to Standing Rock where there was this tremendous uprising of uh, indigenous First Nations people from across the U.S. and some from Canada that came to stand up against a pipeline that, that was being built to carry oil underneath a lake across sacred lands of the Lakota people and uh, that threatened the drinking water not just of the tribe and their lands, but actually of everyone downstream on the Missouri River. And I'm sure as many of you have read about it, heard about it, are familiar with it from the news. It was a tremendous uh, event. Uh, it was a time when tribes got together who had not been in coalition, had not worked together sometimes for hundreds of years or ever. And for me, going there, you sort of walked up to the camp and there was a big, big sign at the entrance. And the sign said, you are entering a place of prayer and ceremony. And it was very powerful. You know, I spent decades telling people, well, I, I think, you know, the spiritual and the political aren't separate. They need to go together. Like, when we do politics, Ticks, when we do political action, we need to have a base in our deep values. You know, when we do spirituality, you know, it needs to be engaged with the world if it's going to be real. If we're going to do political action, we need spirituality or we need something because it's hard and we're going to get burned out if we don't have something to feed and nourish us. You know, so I've been talking about it and writing about it and walking into a space where that was the whole ground of everything was tremendously powerful and to see people really work to hold a sense of the sacred even in a march or even in an action and even facing sometimes some very very intense repression um, was a tremendous inspiration. I think that uh, it was a great example also of saying you know people at camp and in the action were really, really clear, saying, this is an indigenous action. We need to be the ones to make the decisions. We need to be the ones to set the culture. Um, they asked everyone to go through an orientation when we arrived. And in that orientation, they said, look, we love music. Music is great. But in this camp, we actually don't want you to pull out your guitar and start strumming and singing. Uh, we want the music to be our music. If we're doing, you know, we honor every spiritual tradition, but in this camp, we are the ones who are doing the prayer and the ceremony. Um, we went down to the river to do the water ceremony in the morning, and it was beautiful to see people making offerings and singing songs, uh, and, um, and it felt really right, not just to burst into song, but to actually ask the elder, would it be okay to offer one of our songs uh, and to say yes, that would be, you know, and it would have been okay if she had said actually no, that wouldn't be appropriate. So I think that we have a huge opportunity right now if we're willing to take it to learn from people uh, who have held indigenous traditions or struggled to hold them. Uh, for centuries and for generations 
and to really stand in support of indigenous rights and the rights to land and to sovereignty because those rights are integrally bound up with the kinds of responses we need to make to climate change. For those of us who have European heritage, I think it's also important for us to understand the history of how that indigenous thread got broken in Europe. Um, we had a women sweat at Standing Rock and led by a really beautiful, wonderful woman named Lila June. And I went to the sweat at dawn and uh, sitting there by the fire and she came out of the sweat lodge to welcome us. And I saw she was wearing a t-shirt that said Boudica on it. Well, Boudica was the Celtic priestess back in Roman times who led a rebellion against the Romans after her daughters were raped by Roman soldiers and nearly succeeded in throwing them out of Britain. <laughs> and um, one of the things Lila June was saying is like, hey, if your heritage is European, you need to know it. Um, rather than just trying to take our heritage, you need to get in touch with your own. And as I had, was there and meditating, I thought, you know, what is it that often stops us from doing that? And I think often it is the unremembered heritage of the witch persecutions. Because what happened in Europe was uh, up until about the 16th, 17th century, Europe was Christian, but it wasn't that Christian. <laughs> It's kind of like Mexico today, where you know things are nominally Christian, but actually they're still doing the same kinds of rituals and ceremonies they always were. They just maybe are using different words, or they're doing it at the church. Um, you still have curanderas, and you have healers, and brujas, and all of that. Well, that's what Europe was like. And the rich people were Christian, but the ordinary peasants um, kind of did all the old ceremonies they'd always done to connect to the land, to honor the changing of the seasons, to celebrate the harvest. Uh, and that was fine um, up until a certain point in history. Um, the late 1400s, to be precise, just interestingly, at the same time when Columbus sailed the ocean blue and where other things were changing in Europe. I've always been interested that the witch persecutions were not actually medieval. They were Renaissance. They were early modern. And I think that ties into deep social and economic changes that were going on. I wrote about it a long time ago in a book called Dream in the Dark. Uh, and um, there's also a book by Sylvia Federici called Caliban the Witch that talks about it. Um, but in some ways those were times kind of like this. And they were times when a lot of the established order was being shaken up. And part of that was economic. Uh, as the new world got developed, well, brought in all this gold that they found in South America and Central America and caused this enormous inflation in Europe. And suddenly the old landholders whose power base had been holding land were having a hard time economically because of it. And the people who were making money were the new merchants and there was a whole new class that was rising. Uh, science was starting to develop and there was push to develop land in a different way, to mine at deeper levels than anyone had ever mined it before, to uh, take nature and sort of wrench her secrets out of her. And there was challenges to the church like there had never been before with the Protestant Reformation and with lots and lots of social movements and peasant rebellions. So in times like that, the powers that be really love a scapegoat. They really love to have something to focus everyone's attention and fears on. And witches were a great thing. Kind of like terrorists today. You know, why should you focus all your energy and 
all your rebellion against your overlord who's actually the one oppressing you when we can convince you that it's that crazy old woman down the way who's putting a curse on you. And the witch persecutions um, erupted and spread throughout Europe and uh, they were conducted in ways that if you were accused of being a witch basically you were tortured until you confessed and if you didn't confess it didn't mean that you weren't a witch it meant that you were stubborn uh, so there were towns in Germany where the after the witch hunters came through there were hardly any women left alive uh, they were primarily directed against women uh, although not exclusively there were about 20 percent of people who were accused and killed were also men um, I think the result of the witch persecutions is they left a deep sort of cultural legacy. A legacy that sort of said any knowledge that's not officially stamped with the approval of the authorities is dangerous. Uh, any woman who stands up and is powerful and effective uh, is dangerous and possibly evil. I think we saw that legacy really working in our recent elections in people's responses to Hillary Clinton. You know, it was very, very clear to me whether you liked her, didn't like her, liked her policies, there was a level of vitriol about her that was way beyond anything that was rational. And that wasn't just coming from the right wing, that was coming from people who think of themselves as progressive. And I think it actually goes back to the depth of that archetype of powerful women being dangerous and suspect. Um, it meant that healing traditions that weren't the ones approved of by the authorities were seen as dangerous and evil. And it meant that anything that had to do with your intuitive connection to the earth, with understanding the earth is alive and sacred, with understanding that sacredness was embodied and that the universe was dynamic and changing, that became something suspect and evil. And I think that legacy still holds today. Uh, and I think it's a good one for us all to maybe just take a breath and <laughs> release it and recognize that in some ways it is that terrible split, that fear, uh, that need to only believe that what's real is rat, what can be quantified, what can be numbered, you know, that that is what stands in the way of us being able to experience the world as relational, uh, to be able to really make the shift that we need to make in order to truly value those things in the natural world that sustain our lives. And in order to truly stand up for a world in which every human being has a sacred value as a child of the goddess, as an embodiment of that sacred spirit. Um, if we can do that, if we can release some of that fear, then I think we also uh, are actually at a very exciting moment in history. Because the other really surreal aspect about climate change <laughs> is that not only are we not paying attention to it, but when we do, we sort of sink into this morass of despair and despondency as if there were nothing we could actually do about it. Um, which may be partly why we don't pay more attention to it. But actually, there's an enormous amount that we can do about it. And the things that we need to do about it are actually not like grim, horrible, terrible, painful things. <laughs> you know, they, they don't mean that you have to like give up living a decent life and go lie on the ground in the cold and shiver through a freezing Canadian winter in nothing but a bear skin. <laughs> they don't mean that you have to like, uh, I don't know, take little children out and dip them in boiling oil. Or, you know, they're nice things. <laughs> 
means we have to take horrible, poisonous, toxic <laughs> industries and stop extracting them and shift to clean, safe renewables. Like, what's not to like about that? And we can, you know, and we actually can power the world in ways that are clean and that are healthy and that are not going to be like destroying the lands and the lives of indigenous people like a lot of oil extraction is. Uh, it means that we probably need to stop shipping food and commodities and everything we make and touch all over the world and producing them in the places where it's cheapest and labor gets paid the least and environmental standards are the most lax and actually bring enterprises home and relocalize them and produce the things we need somewhere close to where we need them. Uh, it means we need to stop growing our food by pouring poisons on them and herbicides and pesticides and chemical fertilizers on the soil that are destroying the soil and destroying our land and giving us food that actually isn't nourishing and is toxic. And we need to grow food in ways that are healthy and then actually regenerate the soil and regenerate the land and provide habitat for wildlife. Uh, it means we have to stop clear cutting our forests and protect them and plant new forests and have beautiful gardens and trees. And ultimately it means we need community. Because I think if there is one word that's an antidote to climate change, it's community. You know, we need to start building those human relationships that give our lives value and connection, uh, that give us a sense of belonging and a sense that we can make a contribution to other people that's valued and that's important. And when we have that community, then we can do all the rest of it. All the rest of it falls into place. And we need a lot less stuff and have a lot more things like time and love and friendship and good conversations and really good food and potlucks. All those things that make life worth living. <laughs> so, um, in order to do that, again, uh, I think we first of all need to understand and believe that it's possible.